100 million years ago, the cockroaches discover agriculture, become the first superorganism. 10,000 years ago, the first intelligent superorganism forms our own species. Do intelligent superorganisms that exist at the global scale carry within themselves the seeds of their own destruction? Have we got a hope of surviving? What I'm going to do this evening is really talk to you about my latest book. The book came out of uh, my attempt to answer a question that I was asked very frequently when I was talking about climate change, uh, particularly after I'd written The Weathermakers in 2005. And that question was, what are our chances really uh, of surviving this uh, this shift in climate that's looming and that we, we are causing. And the only way I could think of to answer that question was to really go back to the scientific fundamentals, to go back to the process that created us and our planet, and of course look at the intersection between our species and this thing uh, that we call planet Earth, because it's at that intersection that the issue of sustainability arises. And I couldn't think of a better way really of starting to look at the issue than to go back to the work of that man there. The reason I wanted to start with Darwin was because he's the man who really explained to us how, what the process that made us and the process that made our Earth. And his idea, his great idea, was an extremely simple one. It was simply that in every generation there is uh, variation between individuals and that some of those individuals are more likely to survive and reproduce than others and that over the vastness of time that people were just becoming aware of uh, the history of the earth in the mid 19th century that that must tell on um, heritability on those which are on the shape of species as a whole as he put it. So it was a very very simple idea um, but Darwin, being a very wise man, I think, a very uh, perceptive person, decided to sit on that idea for 20 years. And it was only when I went to Darwin's house in Kent that I really understood a little bit more about why he waited so long before he announced this fundamental idea that, that changed our view of the world. Just outside his house, he built a little thing that he called the, the sand walk. And um, that's it there. It's actually a pebble walk. I don't know why he called it the sand walk, but there you go. Even great men can do odd things. Um, and every day of his life at Down House, um, he would walk for several hours around that sand walk. And people have wondered why he did it. What, what was he thinking about? What was he doing as he walked around that racetrack, really? It's just a loop around the forest there. I think what Darwin was doing as he wandered the sand walk was metaphorically fingering his worry beads. He was thinking about the implication of his theory for religious belief in his country, for the shape of civil society and other deep matters. I guess at base what he was worried about was that if he destroyed faith by showing that we were not the unique creation of a loving and caring God, but instead were the result of a, an amoral and utterly cruel process, that by destroying faith he might destroy hope and charity as well and have uh, a very adverse impact upon his society. He may never have published his theory if it hadn't been for this man here. In 1858, 20 years after Darwin first stumbled on the idea um, of how we and every other living thing on the planet was, was made. This man here, Alfred Russell Wallace, was working in Indonesia. He was a, a man 20 years younger than Darwin. He uh, was a working class lad, self-made, went to the tropics to collect biological specimens. And while he was there on the island of Ternate, he had a malarial attack and 
as a result of that malarial attack as he was highly fevered, uh, the idea came to him that perhaps species were created by exactly the same mechanism that Darwin had chanced upon 20 years earlier. When he recovered enough from his malaria to write, he wrote a note to Darwin in great excitement outlining his theory and asked Darwin if, if he wouldn't mind transmitting it to one of the journals to be published in Britain. Well, when Darwin received the letter, he was horrified. He said, you know, Wallace couldn't have made a better pricey or summary of my work if he'd had my notes in front of him. And he thought perhaps that his whole life's work was about to be stolen by this upstart, this working class lad. As it was, he appealed to his friends, um, uh, particularly those uh, who looked after journal publications and so forth, including um, Charles Lyell, the great geologist. And as a result of their intervention, both pieces of work were co-published in July 1858, both Darwin's and Wallace's. And it is extraordinary how, how similar they are. It was like a squib going off in British society. No one took any notice. In fact, the man who uh, was in charge of publishing uh, the journal, uh, uh, Professor Bell, who was a, an expert on the stalk-eyed crustacea, um, wrote in a, his summary of the year 1858 that there'd been no significant scientific discoveries really published in the journal that year, nothing that would revolutionise the Department of Science that they bear upon. Um, of course, he couldn't have been more wrong, and that was showed the following year in 1859 when Darwin published his book on the origin of species. And then, as Darwin perhaps feared, um, with the theory unleashed upon his society, everything began to change. Within five years, Herbert Spencer had coined the term the survival of the fittest, um, and social Darwinism had been born. So I, as I was beginning to look at the process that created us, you know, read, reread Dawkins' Selfish Gene, um, reread Darwin, and began to despair that perhaps we were selfish, short-sighted, ruthless entities forged by an amoral and utterly cruel process. But it was this man here that really gave me hope that that may not necessarily be the case. Alfred Russell Wallace lived a very long and full life, dying at the age of 90. At the age of 80, he was still writing, and in fact, I would argue his most important work was published in 1904, in his eighth decade. And that's the title page of it there, Man's Place in the Universe a study of the results of scientific research in relation to the unity or plurality of worlds. Very, very strange title indeed. But what this book really is, is a summary of Wallace's understanding of what the evolutionary mechanism had created. And being a holistic thinker, his field of endeavour was the entire planet. And this book is the foundation stone of the science of astrobiology. It compares worlds quite literally, and he posits the theory that this planet is the only living planet, that the others, wherever they be in the universe, are all dead. It's also the forerunner of James Lovelock's work on Gaia theory. He talks in the book about the atmosphere, the way the atmosphere works, the way that dust which is often created by living things, is important in regulating Earth's climate system. It's an extraordinary, lucid, uh, uh, what would I say, a prescient work, really, that underpins many aspects of uh, current science, particularly holistic science, like Earth system science, uh, Gaia theory, and so forth. And what we learn from Wallace and his work is that Evolution's legacy is not nasty, brutish and short. It's not a survival of the fittest world. Instead, this cruel and amoral mechanism has led to a world of extraordinary intricacy, interconnectedness and cooperation. And I just want to run through a few examples of that cooperation. This slide just shows mitochondria. They're, they're small organelles that exist in all of our cells. They're the power packs for our cells. It's been realised in the last 30 years or so that these mitochondria actually have nothing to do with us in terms of their origin. They 
originated as free living bacteria a billion years ago in an ancient ocean and they came to cohabit the cells of our bodies much the way algae cohabit with the coral polyps on a coral reef. But over a billion years they have become so closely tied in with our cells and the symbiosis is so intricate now that they can't exist for a millisecond without the cells that they live within, the cells of our body, and our, our, bod our bodily cells cannot survive without them. And that's just the beginning really of the complexity of the thing we call a human being. Um, you know, if I look at my skin, um, I have hundreds of species of bacteria, virus and fungi living all over me. And I do wash, I hasten to add, so don't, don't rush off. It's, it's, we're all like that. We are all, we are all um, ecosystems of near planetary complexity. You know? If you took the cells that are me and my mitochondria away, you would still have a shadow of my entire body here because about 10% of my body mass is, is made up of other species all of the gut flora and fauna in my intestines, everything covering my skin, the special mites that only survive in human eyebrows, the other species of mites that only survive at the base of human eyelashes. Um, we are ecosystems of planetary complexity. And what are we at the end of the day? We, we are ultimately just animated bits of Earth's crust for all of that complexity. That's what the evolutionary process tells us. That's what Biochemistry tells us our, our, our chemical origin is in the Earth's crust, dating back four billion years when the spark of life first sparked on our planet. And of course we're the same today. To draw a line, a separation line between us and the rest of the planet is foolish in terms of thinking. So what is the big entity that we are part of, that we are part of the crust of? That's it there. And the way I think about the planet is simply information systems organise matter. So what is the information system at work here? It is DNA, which is a digital information system, um, which obviously it's the blueprint of our bodies, it has created our bodies. But even more than that, it has created that entity that we see today. 4.5 billion years old, nothing going in but sunlight pretty much, nothing going out but heat and yet it's created this extraordinary entity. I'd just like to concentrate briefly on the three organs of the planet because they tell a tale of dramatic modification by life itself, by DNA. The first is the crust, formed of two bits. We've got the oceanic crust here, the continental crust here. In the very early stages of the Earth, there was no continental crust. These rocks were made by the weathering of these rocks, and scientists have recently come up with the rather intriguing notion that the continents would not exist without life. And that's because we can calculate the energy budget of the early Earth, the primitive Earth. Um, we can work out rates of erosion that are required to create the early continents. And the figures just don't add up. There is an energy deficit. So where was the energy coming from to create the erosion of oceanic rocks that led to the continents being formed. It can only have come from one source, it's been argued, and that is life itself. Life capturing energy from the sun, creating acids and so forth. These are very primitive bacteria and other primitive forms of life that helped hasten the erosion of rocks and so created the earth, the ground beneath our feet. The ocean itself we know from um, uh, studies, paleontological studies, uh, did not resemble its current form two billion years ago. It was full of metals, um, dissolved metals, heavy metals and so forth, um, and was very different, was inhospitable to life. The atmosphere didn't resemble the modern atmosphere. James Lovelock argues that that very thin layer, about as thick as an onion skin on an earth the size of an apple, um, is 99% a creation of life, that almost all of the gases in the atmosphere, with the exception of the noble gases, are made by life itself for life's own purpose. So there is a profound impact of life on the system. We can think of the Earth quite literally as a, a living planet, but what exactly is it? And this is 
the question that Lovelock and other earth scientists are asking. The name Gaia comes from the ancient Greek and the ancient Greeks believed that the earth was one whole and perfect living being, like a human being. They believed it was a living creature. I don't think, in fact no scientist today believes that that is a tenable hypothesis because the earth just is not as tightly integrated nor is it as well regulated as a living creature such as ourselves. And yet it clearly has some self-regulating capacity. I want to talk a little bit about hierarchies of organisation um, between an individual like ourselves and the planet, or an ecosystem for that matter. And the most important of those hierarchies uh, is a thing called the superorganism. Here is a great example of a superorganism. These are termites. You can see that they differ quite a lot one to the other, yet they're all the same species. A superorganism is a, a level of organisation that is between that of our bodies and something like an ecosystem or the planet as a whole. Uh, and it is, action is mediated through these things, these, these creatures through pheromones. Um, perhaps the best way to start thinking about the origin of the social insects like termites is to think where they came from. A hundred million years ago, uh, these things were cockroaches. I mean, they're just, they're, they are just very specialised and modified cockroaches. But um, it was when cockroaches discovered agriculture that they became superorganisms living together like that. They always, they seem to always have the upper hand over us, the cockroaches, don't they? There they were a hundred million years before us, um, uh, building, building farms and cities. And look at that. It's like a skyscraper with its own air conditioning system, with its own water security system, with its own gardens, roads. Um, it's a very complex entity. And the similarities between that structure and our cities is striking, despite the fact that there are many differences as well. The other thing that you see if you look at these superorganisms is that they tend to share a particular point of view, a philosophy, if you want, a, a set of ideals. And that is another very important piece of glue, I think, that holds our civilizations together. What happens when these superorganisms meet? Very, very interesting. Sure, there's a lot of disaster. There is warfare and so forth. But there is also an immense exchange because the bigger the group is, the greater the division of labor, the greater the benefits, the greater the opportunities of trade, the more amenity that is created. I know I've wandered a long way from my initial question, have we got a hope of surviving climate change? And I want to return to that with just that background of our species and the planet. There are two ways really of thinking about, about this. Um, and one comes from an understanding of the evolutionary mechanism as elucidated by Darwin and Dawkins, which if fused with a sense of our current impact on the environment can lead one to despair. And that particular theory has been really articulated most fully by Peter Ward, a paleontologist, in his book The Medea Hypothesis. He puts it up in opposition to James Lovelock's Gaia Hypothesis. The name comes from the ancient Greek as well, Medea, the woman who, uh, slighted by her husband, slaughtered her own children. And Ward uses that, uh, that name because he believes that life is inherently destructive to life. That in a Malthusian world where populations just continue to increase and the capacity to feed them uh, increases arithmetically while the population increases exponentially, species are destined to crash. It's a very dismal view of the world. It really is a survival of the fittest uh, view of the world and in Ward's eyes, humans are nothing special. We are simply a continuation of the great destructive capacity of the planet and that within a few generations we will lead to the sixth great extinction and life will go on without us. As this suggests, I have quite a different view of that. I think that if we look at not just evolution's mechanism but its legacy, 
we see great reason for hope. We see the intricate interrelatedness of life as a whole. We see that while our species has, has impacts, the power of coevolution, the power of the division of labour leads to hope for collaboration and a very different relationship with life on Earth. And I just want to explore that a little bit with you. And the Montreal Protocol, ratified in 1987, I think will be celebrated one day as the first global festival, first national, or sorry, truly global day of celebration on our planet. You can see here where we were in terms of ozone depletion. So this is ozone here, relatively less ozone in 1974, a depletion of ozone through to 94, continuing 2009, 2020 still slightly, and of course these are projections of what would have happened without Montreal, without the Montreal Protocol on this side. Through to 2060, you are down to very, very low levels of ozone. Life can't exist on Earth as we know it without ozone because ultraviolet radiation tears our DNA apart. For every percentage decrease, or sorry, every percentage increase in ultraviolet radiation, there's a percentage increase in a failure for seeds to germinate in our crops. There's a percentage increase in blindness for any creature with eyes. And of course the problem is a, a long-lived one. These um, chemicals that lead to ozone depletion or are banned under the Montreal Protocol have a long lifetime in our atmosphere. So we needed to act well in advance of, of the worst manifestations of the problem occurring. Thankfully we did that and you see there over time, from 1980 to 2005, ozone concentrations decreasing, but then flattening out. And now, just over the last couple of years, scientists have announced that they're confident that the ozone protection for our planet is regrowing, and by 2050, it will be back at levels that it was before we ever started releasing these CFCs. Another great achievement for humanity, acting as a whole, every nation had to agree to phase out these dangerous chemicals. I think we are in a critical phase at the moment where the new social media, such as the internet, mobile phones and so forth, are causing our species to cohere as a single global intelligence, where ideas are shared instantly and where the interconnectedness between individual and individual is at an unparalleled level of ease. What these social media are also doing is empowering individuals. So we're seeing for the first time uh, outside, well, well, not the first time, but we're seeing at an accelerated rate, particularly in places like North Africa and the Middle East, people throwing off dictatorships, aided and empowered by these new social media. And it's, I, I think it's an amazing phenomenon. Uh, I was watching the news, looking at what was happening in Syria just a few nights ago, and there was these people who looked terribly alien at first. There was men dressed in these Arabic costume, you know, the, the thobe and the headdress, and, and women dressed in the hijab, and they were talking in Arabic. And when I listened to the rhythm of the chant, I realised what they were saying is, the people united will never be defeated. And it made me think, you know, there's, there is a common humanity here. There's a common series of aspirations we all have that as we become empowered, come to the surface. And as we become interconnected, become ever more transparent. Where's all of that heading? It's anybody's guess. But what I think we're seeing now is the emergence of a truly global superorganism, which is capable, in principle at least, of acting as an intelligence for our planet. And if you look at Wallace's legacy and Wallace's insights into coevolution, you can see that that is the way things, that's the way that the information that organises the matter that's us has always worked. Command and control systems have been thrown up again and again in nature. Um, our brains are a, are a great example. Maybe Earth is throwing up a command and control system for itself in the form of this emergent global superorganism. People say that that can never be because humans are greedy and selfish. Um, well, I've got news. Brains are also greedy and selfish. Brains weigh about 2% of our body mass, yet they take in 20% of the energy. They use 20% of the energy that our bodies take in, so they're greedy. They're also incredibly selfish, as any doctor would know. Um, 
brains will cut off supplies to almost every other part of the body before they deprive themselves for a second. They're very, very selfish, just like us. So we're greedy and selfish. And it's interesting that 20% of, of the energy of the planet humans are currently use, using uh, something in excess of 20% uh, of the total biocapacity of the planet. Perhaps we shall come back into balance. But just because we're greedy and selfish doesn't mean we can't form Earth's control and command system. The other important thing to realise about us, of course, is that any command and control system has to be self-regulating. What's stopping the brain from taking even more resources? It has to live within the constraints that its body offers it. And we, our species is becoming um, self-regulating because we, we see in the UN population projections, sure, we've reached 7 billion people this month on the planet, but the projections are that within just 40 years, we will be at a population perhaps of 9 billion and starting to plateau out. So within 150 years, the entire human species will have gone through the demographic transition. That's incredible. In the 4 billion year history of the planet, there has never been a species that's escaped the trap that Thomas Malthus described so eloquently, where the population expands exponentially, the means to feed it expands only arithmetically. We are the first species ever to escape that trap. And in doing so, we have become self-regulating, at least in terms of our numbers. And that gives me great hope for the future of our species and our planet. Just to summarise, what is our Earth like? And where, by analogy, uh, should we place it? James Lovelock, the originator of the Gaia theory, has a particular view on this. He says that Gaia, the Earth system, is like an old lady who has to share her house with a growing and destructive group of teenagers. Gaia grows angry, and if they don't mend their ways, she'll evict them. In other words, the Medea hypothesis. I think that Lovelock's wrong about that. I think that if you look at the Earth more objectively, you see that Gaia is much more like a newborn baby. Because newborns have new-formed brains, just like our Earth now, which is going through this process of forming a global superorganism, intimately interconnected. Nervous systems, just as our satellite surveillance systems are arguably nervous systems for the planet and the many natural systems that exist as well to integrate us and the rest of nature. And bodies, the Gaian system as a whole. <laughs> but these are yet to be fully integrated, just as our Earth is today. We have the newly emergent consciousness, we have the technology, but we have, they are yet to be fully integrated. So self-control and self-awareness remain rudimentary as the human species, I would argue, is today. It's also axiomatic that infancy is the most dangerous period of life. So we are going through a dangerous transition. I'd just like to revisit that idea that information organises matter in the context of the life of our planet, the life of Gaia. Formed 4.5 billion years ago out of a ball of atmospheric dust. Life originating around about 4 billion years ago, many scientists now think, very, very early in the history of our planet. By just after 3 billion years ago, life has taken control of Earth systems. So the chemical equilibrium that characterises dead planets is banished and dramatic chemical disequilibrium is enforced by the life system itself, by the enormous energy budget, 100 terawatts, that life commands today. By three billion years ago, that budget was sufficient to take control of the systems. 100 million years ago, the cockroaches discover agriculture, become the first superorganism. 10,000 years ago, the first intelligent superorganism forms our own species. And perhaps today, the very end of the line, we can see the birth of a new integrated Gaia, perhaps, taking place, where humans at least have the potential to act as a command and control system on the planet, much as our brain does for our bodies. When might Gaia be said to have reproduced? I would argue that the moment we colonise another heavenly body, another planet, we can think of Gaia as having reproduced. Alfred Russell Wallace, my great scientific hero, said at the very end of his book, Man and the Universe, that perhaps 
it was human destiny to fulfill the human spirit in the vastness of the universe. It's a thought that really struck with me for two reasons. One is that if you look, sorry, if you look at the time scales involved in planetary travel, even at the rate we can travel through space today, it'd only take us five million years to colonise the whole galaxy. And that's a, and from a paleontological perspective, that's quick. It's amazing, I think. Um, but secondly, as well, because it, it highlights just how very much is at stake for this generation, this decade. Right? This, this is the moment of decision. It's an enormous privilege, I think, to be born and to be alive here and now, because we're the generation that will actually make the decisions about this. We'll decide whether we're... In, it's too difficult to wean ourselves off the fossil fuels and move to cleaner energy and thereby precipitate a global crisis that might destabilise food systems and lead to the demise of this global superorganism that has only now taken shape. The way I think about the options before us are really framed by a, one of my other scientific heroes, a man called Enrico Fermi. He was a, an Italian physicist and one day, one evening, he looked up into the heavens and knew that there were billions of stars there and asked a very simple question. He said, why the great silence? Why aren't we hearing from other intelligences out there in the vastness of the universe? And there really are only two satisfactory explanations to Fermi's paradox, I think, as, as that question has become known. One is that intelligent superorganisms that exist at the global scale carry within themselves the seeds of their own destruction, so that soon after birth, they inevitably die, and therefore the great silence persists in the universe. The second possibility, however, is that we genuinely are the first. Now, on the face of it, that might seem incredibly unlikely. But if you look at the time scale of the universe, so extend that back another 10 billion years, you realise that it takes three generations of stars to create the heavy elements that make life even possible. So that's taking up to here before you can even think about having life in the universe because you don't have carbon, you don't have any of the other heavy elements that have to be born in the hearts of stars over three generations. And then, of course, it takes all of evolutionary time to create an intelligent global superorganism. So maybe, just maybe, we are the first and maybe Wallace is right that we will go on to perfect the human spirit in the vastness of the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you.